What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video on the Tanner Martin Outdoors YouTube channel. Now, if you are new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the little notification bell right next to it. That way you won't miss out on any of the new videos that I come out with here in the future. And today's video, as you can probably tell by the title, we're gonna be talking all about topwater frogs. If you guys know anything about me at all, you know I absolutely love to throw a topwater frog, especially here on Geist Reservoir, which is where we are today. So if you hear some weird noises in the background, there's jet skis running all over the place. People are skiing, screaming. So if you hear any weird noises, that's what that is. But like I said, today we're gonna to talk about frogs. So this here is my frog box. It honestly needs restocked, but there's enough in there that I can make this video. I've made a couple videos on frog fishing, um, but you know, as time evolves, things change. Everybody learns some more, you know, ways to fish a frog. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to talk about some of my favorite frogs, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, a couple modifications I make to the frogs to make the hookup ratio actually uh, increase and then uh, show you guys how I actually fish the frog. So like I said, this here is my frog box and the way I organize it is I take uh, on the left side, these are all my pointed nose frogs, which is this the normal frog you guys are, when you think of a frog, this is what you guys probably think of, just the normal pointed nose frog, walking frog, uh, or like a mat frog. Over here, I kind of got uh, the top two rows here are my popping frogs, and then these bottom ones are just kind of miscellaneous frogs uh, that I still do throw. So when it comes to frog fishing, I like to keep it stupid, stupid simple. When you go into the store and you look at the frog wall, there's gonna be so many different colors. And in my mind, I just try and keep it stupid simple. So when you go in there and look at a frog, most people will see the back of the frog because that's what is in the packaging. What the most important color is, is actually the bottom of the frog. The back doesn't matter. You have all these frogs that have, you know, these cool designs on the back of the frog. These, you know, they have all these designs, but look at that one. That one's been chewed a little bit. Uh, they have all these cool designs on the back of the frog, but the underbelly is just bland. And that's really the part that actually matters. So when it comes to your pointed nose frogs, like I said, I like to keep it stupid simple. As far as colors goes, I like whites, whites and yellows, straight yellows, whites and yellows um, or black. Uh, I really don't try and deviate too much from there. The only one that I will mix in for my pointed nose frogs is brown. I don't have any of those right now because most of the time if I'm throwing a brown frog, I'm throwing it in like a popping version. But for your matte frogs, color isn't as important because you're gonna be throwing these over grass mats. And really you just need that pointed nose so that you're not gonna be pulling a popping nose through the grass and getting it hung. So I keep my colors stupid simple. Uh, like I said, whites, yellows, yellow and white, black, brown, pretty much that's all you need. So when I'm fishing my pointed nose frogs, there's really only a couple, you know, brands that I like to use. There's a whole bunch of different frog brands out there. This one here is a Spro. Spros are really good. Uh, they skip really well. Um, I like to use the Spros. Booyah Pad Crashers. This is one of the Savage Gear frogs. Um, and that's pretty much it. I keep it pretty simple. Spro, Booyah Pad Crasher, Savage Gear. Um, every now and then I'll mix in like a Jackal or a River to Sea. But other than that, you really don't need to go all out and pay $13, $14 for a frog because some of those can get pretty expensive. You can go to the store and buy one of these, what are they, like six bucks? Uh, one of these pad crashers and catch fish all day long and it is one of my top three favorite frogs. So now that we've talked about what I like to throw and the colors I like to throw for my walking frogs, my pointed nose frogs, now we're going to talk about uh, the colors that I like for my popping frogs and I tr try to keep it stupid simple just like everything else. I really throw four main colors. Um, I'm either going to throw a brown frog, a white frog, a black frog, or with the exception that a lot of times I'll pick up one of these bluegill pattern frogs. Now this frog right here is the frog that you'd walk into the store and see it and say that is a beautiful frog because it really is. It's got some beautiful colors in it. It's an awesome frog. It looks really good. It appears to the angler a lot, but not only does it do that, but it catches fish. When I'm throwing that popping frog, a lot of times, uh, especially with the Booyah popping pad crasher, it actually walks just as good as uh, the regular pointed nose pad crasher. 
Um, and so when, because of that, I'll actually pick up the pop and pad crasher in substitution for that pointed nose regular pad crasher because not only can I walk it just as good, but I'm also gonna be able to chug it, pop it, do other things if I need to. Now with the poppin' frogs, I'll keep it pretty much the same. I'm gonna throw my Spros, I'm gonna throw my Booyah Pad Crashers, and I'm gonna throw my Savage Gears. Uh, they just actually came out with this Savage Gear Frog, I believe it's called the DC, I think, or, or, or something like that. Um, but this is a beautiful frog, and walks really well, skips really well, imitates a bluegill really well, and if I'm trying to imitate bluegill, I'll pick up this gill color in the Savage Gear Frog, and it does, it, it does its work. Let's talk about the gear that you're gonna use. A lot of times I'll use this rod right here. It's a seven foot one, uh, medium heavy, but it's more of a heavy action, uh, but it's rated medium heavy. The reason that I use this most of the time is because a lot of times when I'm fishing frogs, I'm skipping up under laydowns, I'm skipping around docks, I'm making short little pitches. So I don't need a seven foot four, seven foot six heavy, extra heavy broomstick because I need that tip to be able to skip underneath places. So uh, the reel I'm gonna pair this up with is I've always thrown it on this reel. This is an older Shimano Corrado. It's a big bulky reel. Uh, it's got a lot of line on it. Um, and honestly, I've been looking to, to change reels for my frog and I'm probably gonna switch over to a, a to Tula just because the smaller profile and your hand can kind of hurt from walking the frog all day long with this big reel. Uh, but I, I've gotten used to it. I use this in a seven to one gear ratio. Uh, a lot of people like to frog with a, a 10, that Revo Rocket a lot of people like to use and I don't necessarily like to use that because the higher in gear ratio you go, the lower your power is gonna be. So you're not gonna have as much cranking power. Um, so if you're fishing, you know, say you skip up under a bush and there's a bunch of laydowns and you set the hook, you're not gonna have that power to crank it out, crank them out of there. Now it's nice to be able to um, reel up real fast and make another pitch. Uh, but I, I like to stick around the seven or the eight to gear ratio reels. I like to throw, this here is a 50 pound braid. Uh, I used to throw 65 a lot but that 50 pound comes off the spool, uh, the spool just a little bit better and you can, you can skip a little bit better. If you're like punching or fishing a frog in a real thick mat, then that's when I'll go to like 65 pound. But 50 pound is gonna have a little thinner diameter, so you're gonna be able to cast a little bit further too. And like I said, it's just gonna come off the spool a little bit better. Um, I've never had any problems breaking off with the, the 50 pound braid. Um, now, a lot of times when I tie to my frog, I actually will tie a double Palomar knot. It's basically a normal Palomar knot, but when you go through the loop, you just go through twice. Uh, it gives it just a little bit extra strength, um, and I've never broke off on a frog. I mean, I, I never have any problems. In my opinion, there's not one frog out there that has the best body design, has the best hooks, has the best weight design. Just, there's not one frog that's designed perfectly. And because of that, I'm actually designing a frog right now. I'm gonna be working on it, hopefully gonna be coming out with it next year if we can get it done. Um, but I'm taking all my modifications that I like to do to frogs, and I'm gonna make one frog that's already modified that you can take out of the box, tie it on, and go fishing with it, and catch fish. And all you'll have to do is just trim the, uh, the legs. Speaking about trimming the legs, that's one of the first modifications I'll do. I'll take the legs and trim them down. I'll show you here. This is a brand new pop and pad crasher. You can see how long those legs are. And here is one that I've trimmed up. I pretty much cut a lot of that, those legs off of it. I'll just take my, my scissors here and just snip, snip and trim it. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. A lot of people say trim the length of the body. A lot of people say trim one the length of the body and one the length of the eye. Uh, because if you trim one shorter than the other, if you're not the best at walking a frog, it'll walk better if you trim one leg shorter than the other. Uh, but once you get used to walking a frog, you can just trim them both uh, the same length. I try to go, uh, uh, this, this one's a length of the eye. I just kind of gauge it. Normally I leave about an inch and a half, two inches of the legs there. A lot of times if I'm fishing in a mat, I'll completely cut them off because the fish already has to come up through the grass. I don't want them to just grab the tails anyway or the legs anyway. So I'll actually just cut them pretty much bare, just leave little stubs there. Um, and that frog will actually come through that top, the top of that mat a lot better. Second modification that I like to do, you don't have to do this, but if you notice you're missing fish, as you take your pliers and you actually tip the hooks, uh, you wanna tip them up and out. A lot of frogs will come with the hooks tipped down and in, 
so that they'll be pointed in towards the body. If you tip them up and out so that they're right on the edge of the body, um, you'll increase your hookup ratio. Now you might get snagged a little bit more. Actually, the Savage Gear Frog they came out with, the way they designed their body, is those hooks, you can see when you, do, when you press that body, those hooks are already tipped up. And if you look at them, they're, they're pretty straight. Uh, they're not tipped in like a lot of the hooks come. So what Savage Gear did is they designed their body so that it would hide those hooks where if you have like a pad crasher here, you can see that body's flat all the way across. So that's why they designed this valley here. Now, if you run your finger, finger over it, you don't get the hook. Now, if you just barely push down and rub your finger over it, you get the hook and that hurts. I'm not gonna do that because these are super sharp hooks. They designed the body really well and put the right hooks on here. So when the fish comes up and eats the frog, it's gonna grab it. And as soon as it barely presses down, I'm already getting hooked. So that's one thing you can do. Now, one of the last modifications that I'll do is I'll take some super glue. This is just Gorilla Glue. It's got this screw cap, works really well. So you just basically unscrew the cap and I'll put a couple dots of glue. I'll put one around the actual line tie and then I'll put some glue around the uh, weight in the bottom and the belly of it and the butt of the frog. When that weight punches through or if the weight falls out, then you're gonna, that frog's pretty much ruined unless you have some extra weights um, from some frogs that have been destroyed um, because then it's just gonna fill up with water every cast. It's not gonna sit on the surface and walk like it's supposed to. All right, so we talked about the frog and some of the modifications I like to do to it. Now I wanna talk about some of the ways I like to fish it. One of the ways is like this stuff right behind me here. We have a seawall, we have the grass blown in. It's, one of, it's a perfect spot. Throw a frog up there, fish around that structure. You know, a lot of people will think in the middle of the day, it's real hot, it's sunny, you know, it's not gonna be good topwater fishing, which that's not true at all. It's actually easier to fish topwater in the middle of the day than it is in the morning when it's overcast or cloudy or, or did the lights just getting up and it's just getting uh, some sun on some banks. It's actually easier to fish when it's sunny because that's gonna create your shade lines. You're gonna have specific spots down the bank or around the lake that have shade on them and that's the spots you wanna target. So a lot of times I actually like to stay away from the big matted grass flats and stuff when I'm fishing a frog. Now, although that's good because that creates a big canopy and it's just like you going out on your porch and sitting uh, in the shade during the middle of the day, uh, I like to target areas that don't have as much grass um, because it's easier to predict where the fish are gonna be. If you're fishing in a big mat, a uh, big matted grass flat, you're like, well, there's hundreds of yards of grass. I don't know where these fish are gonna be. So I like to target areas that have grass blown in, isolated clumps and uh, around docks, wood. Some of the best frog fishing is when you have a rock bank with some docks on it, or a rock bank, and that grass is just barely growing in to the lake. I call it like the river grass, and then it has uh, that duckweed or just like scum blown into it. That's some of the best frog fishing. If you have a lake that has grass on it as well as docks, just fish in between the docks, uh, and there's surely going to be grass there. As long as they're not spraying it, uh, then you're going to have all that blown in scummy crap that's like it's not even grass. It's like, I don't even know what you call it. It's yuck is what it is. So those are a couple of my best frog fishing tips. Now let's pick up this frog, go down this bank, hit a couple spots, see if we can't catch some fish. And uh, if not, I'll just show you guys a bunch of frog fish catches from this year. Cause I've caught a lot of fish on a frog and they've been chewing it out here on Geist. So uh, like I said, don't be afraid. If it's you know noon and you have some time to kill, but you're like, man, I want to, I want to catch them on a frog, but it's hot, it's noon, it's middle of the day. I'm not, they're not going to bite a top water. That's not true. Just get out there, fish those shade lines, fish that grass, fish the isolated stuff, the spots where you can predict where they're going to be a little bit better, rather than just a big grass mat, and you'll catch some more frog fish this year. Something weird. Garen. Yeah. Oh 
Oh my gosh, that's a giant. That's a giant. No, it's not. It's just a tree. Well, do you have Mega? Because I got Mega, so it's different. You have to set it for different. Because Mega shows up different. Because, like, when I... Oh my gosh! Yeah. It's a real good one. Yeah. Yeah. 